My name's um, Dr. Michelle Ann Thin, and I teach at RMIT University, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight to introduce to you an amazing panel um, during this week, which is, as probably you know, Refugee Week. Um, so welcome and thank you for coming to tonight's salon, um, RMIT Culture Literary and Ideas Salon, and I think this is our first um, literary salon, so well done uh, to the team to making it against you know the odds considering that we've had this uh, terrible pandemic to deal with it's been amazing to um, actually get here I think it's really a fantastic thing um, so tonight's topic is on migration and detention and it's a very fitting topic I think this week because of course it's refugee week um, and I believe June 20th was refugee day so that's a really interesting and telling thing there are currently 26.4 million refugees in the world but tonight our discussion is probably a little bit wider than just um, refugees we're really talking about migration and detention and if we look at those numbers, um, there are 82.4 million people in the world who are fleeing violence, war, um, persecutions, and human rights violations. And this is, you know, an incredible number. Um, and yet, um, it, you know, the stories that come out of it aren't necessarily all sad. They're kind of rich and amazing. And I think tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about that. I'm really looking forward to this panel because my background is... Um, from Myanmar. I was born in Myanmar and I left with my parents after the coup in 1962. And we grew, I grew up in Canada, you can tell from the accent. And so this idea of what migration is and um, you know how we kind of deal with it and how we deal with it in our art is a really massively interesting topic to me. So I'm really delighted to be here tonight. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the people of the Wai Wurrung and Bun Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we conduct this event. We respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past and present. RMIT University also acknowledges the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia. Now I'm going to tell you something that I probably, I wasn't sure if I should say or not, but I was a little bit ambivalent when I was asked to do the acknowledgement because it feels to me like migration and indigenous sovereignty are sometimes, you know, there's tension there. But the things that occurred to me as I was thinking about coming in and talking, um, introducing this panel tonight, is that there are two things that kind of tie those groups together. And one is power and who has power and who enables um, people to take their place in land and displacement. And those are two very po potent topics, which I'm sure our panel will discuss tonight. Now, on the subject of the panel, I have bad news and I have fantastic news. The bad news is that, unfortunately, Andre Dow can't be with us tonight. He has um, uh, a family illness, and so he has to stay home. And it's unfortunate, but we are very fortunate to have three amazing speakers, and you are in for a treat if the conversations in the green room are anything to go by. Um, so tonight, we are going to be hearing from Shukafe Azar, who moved to Australia as a political refugee a decade ago. She's a journalist and author of essays, articles, short stories, and children's books. She is the first Iranian woman to hitchhike the entire length of the Silk Road, which is in itself an incredible achievement, and I'm looking forward to hear about that. <laughs> the Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree, Green Gauge Tree, originally written in Farsi, was shortlisted for the International Booker Prize and Australia's Stella Prize, and it's an amazing read. I really enjoyed it. We're also going to be hearing from Zana Freon, who is a multi-award winning author of books for children and young adults. Her work has been published in over 15 countries and is in development for both stage and screen. Her book, The Bone Sparrow, explores a refugee child's experience from being born in an Australian permanent detention centre. And I think there's a lot of work that's come out of the research there, so it'll be really fascinating to hear what Zana has to say about this. And of course, our intrepid host, we're very lucky to have Astrid Edwards. She is not only the program manager of RMIT's associate degree of professional writing and editing, she's also an interviewer, a podcaster, an advocate. She's a bibliophile and hosts two bookish podcasts, The Garrett, Writers on Writing, and Anonymous Was a Woman. She serves as the chair of the Melbourne's Writers' Festival as well. So, big hand for our panel, and I'm going to leave it to them. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. It is an honour to be on stage uh, with Shakufa and Zana and to be back in real life. This is the first time 
I have been on stage with people for more than 15 months. So if I'm a little bit nervous, that would be why. Tonight, I am thrilled to be exploring the idea of how books, how writing, and how literature can help us think through and address the many crises that, that we face. This is one of RMIT's first salons, uh, and tonight I'm going to do my best to, to help us figure out what on earth is happening in Australia and how maybe the books that we choose to write and to support and to buy and the writers we choose to support can help change Australia. My first question to both of you is quite broad and deliberately so. When we are thinking about migration and detention, the narratives that we hear in our public discourse, in the media, in books, politicians, all of it, what do you think is the dominant narrative, and is it often negative? Shukufa, would you like to go oh, first? Yes. <laughs> okay, hello everyone, lovely to be here. So, talking about the migration, about, I want to talk about my experience, I think. I am boat asylum seeker, I came to Australia by boat, in a roofless boat, five days on the ocean, with the other nationalities of Iraqi and Afghani, some Iranian <coughs> and I had no any idea that what I want to do in Australia if we want to back to your question so I was journalist in Iran I always want to dedicate my life for writing as a journalist and also um, fiction writer but I had no English so I came to Australia with no English and it was really hard, it was really hard. The only thing that I said to myself was that Shukufa, you don't have language, you don't have your you know, culture and country here, but what you have is freedom. The only way that you can continue your way and actually benefit in being immigrant in the modern country like Australia is to just be, have a voice that you were not allowed to have it before in Iran, so because of a strong censorship. So I started writing in Farsi. I had no idea that how I want to find translator, how I want to find publisher, if Australian like my story or not. And you know, there are, I knew nothing about Australia. The only things was I know what I want to write, what I want to say, and how I want to say. And uh, so they always open up little by little. And um, so I want to say that the whole process is difficult, you know, especially if you have this kind of job, like creative job in art and writing. It's so difficult to open your way in new culture, new language. I, did, I had no idea what Australian like to read. I had no idea they like magic realism at all <coughs> or a story about Iran. And uh, as much as I knew was that Australian like to read more English books. They didn't like to read translation, and they like more to read documentary or, you know, or realistic stories, not magic realism. But anyway, I want to say, because I believe what I want to do, I had also very lucky to just little by little open my, my way to, you know, to publication, to creative uh, world, and it's just so tough. This is the only thing that I can say. And um, and th there is nothing that you can avoid also, you know, you should, you love your work and you, sh you just spend your, you know, your life for that. I, I, I also want to say something else. We always in Australia, when we talk about immigration, we think Australia, about Australia, we don't think about the, another country that we left, you know, and we came to this country. Our absence in our countries is huge. You know, and these are things that we should think about that, you know, millions of Iranian immigrants uh, legally or illegally to another, mostly in West, to Western countries just because of freedom. And uh, you can imagine how many of, you know, how many of, you know, educated people left country and left Iran without, you know, creativity, without, you know, voice and it's, it's really sad in, in you know when you think of the countries like Iran, Afghanistan you know when, when people left the country and we, co we come here to I think the only thing that I want to say and then let you talk is that uh, when we come here people like me 
that we have kind of plan in our life. Okay, my way was literature in my whole life, was journalism, writing. And uh, when, we, we, when I come here, I said, you should just continue your way. It's tough, but you can just keep going because you, I don't have any job. I can't be, you know, like uh, to accept any other kind of job. I'm not good at anything. <laughs> Even I'm not enough good at writing, I try to be, <laughs> but uh, it's really, I can't be, I don't know, work in hospital, I can't work in office, I can't work, never, I was journalist, the only thing that I know, but it's tough, the only thing that I can say. I would say that you know how to do many, many things and nobody in this hall here today undervalues or does not value oh, no. <laughs> writing, uh, whether it be journalism or literature. Yeah. <laughs> Zana, can I give you the floor? You can. Hi, everyone. Um, I wish that narrative of, of thinking about uh, the absence which is left behind and the, um, the gifts that, that refugees bring to our country, I wish that was the narrative we were telling um, because from my perspective, that's, that's not the narrative that we, we see at all. Um, and I wrote, uh, you know, the Bone Sparrow. I have no lived experience of, of the refugee experience, um, but... I wrote The Bone Sparrow because I was seeing this narrative in the media um, and it was, it was so negative and so dehumanising um, and it was, for me, a way of processing that, that information, that, that world we live in and also um, the idea that everyone was, was sort of falling for it. You know, we were, we were being fed these lies and we were believing it. Um, and I think there's a really interesting moment in Australian history you know, it probably goes back well before then, but for me it felt like the, the defining moment was um, the, the Children Overboard Affair in 2001. Um, for those of you who remember it, um, it there, was, there was a photo that was put out to the media of a, of a um, I think it was a woman, but I can't remember, of a, of a person holding their child, they were on a, on a boat that was sinking, holding their child in the air. And um, it was purported by the media and the government agencies that uh, the refugees were throwing their children or threatening to throw their children overboard and into the sea to force us to, to take them. What had actually happened, as was later revealed, was there was an asylum seeker boat that was in Australian waters. Um, the Navy intercepted it and they said, um, they, they threw a note onto the, onto the boat that said, turn around, go back to where you came from. And when um, the people on the boat didn't turn around, they then allegedly shot ammunition very close over the boat, um, at which point people held up their children and said, don't shoot, there are children on board. Um, and then what happened was the Navy boat tried to uh, tow the boat back to international waters and the boat fell apart. Um, and at that point, there were people in the water, the Navy saved them all, no lives were lost at that point in time. And all the while, photos were being taken, except we didn't see those photos. We saw the photos of the people holding their children in the, in the air. We saw the photos of the people in the water and were told that they had thrown their children overboard. And I remember I was overseas th at the time and I thought, Australia's crazy. Like, what are they doing? No one's going to fall for this. Like, we're just going to be seen as, you know, it, for what we were, except everyone fell for it. Everyone, everyone decided that that was, that was the reality that we would follow. Um, and I think from then on, our policies and the way we talk about asylum seekers and refugees has just become more and more inhumane. Um, there were again directives back in, I think it was 2012, um, maybe 2013, where there was a, um, a directive to change the term from, um, or to, to illegal maritime arrivals. So to change away from refugees and asylum seekers to illegal maritime arrivals and talk about transferees because that dehumanises people. Um, so before then it had been, we were talking about clients. Um, and so all these little things which seem so small at the time, they, and, and you know, the illegal, it suddenly made a criminal act, something which is a, a human right and by international law, everyone's allowed to, and Australian law, you're allowed to seek safety. Um, so all those little things, they, they build and build until they become part of our discourse. You've mentioned freedom and you've, you've um, alluded, Zana, to uh, how borders and refugees and migration is referred to in our media and, you know, Tampa and many other crises uh, since then have focused on the event or focused on the boat or focused on the border crossing and not the life. Uh, and not what happens next um, in detention and then beyond detention. I'd like to explore both of, uh, with both of you 
where does that narrative of freedom of speech and a free media that is reporting you know, individual events that happened, often poorly, but nevertheless reporting, and the idea of freedom of speech and the right to write what you want mm. and what you choose and what drives you? Yeah. Yes, the speed of all hardship that we experience as a, you know, uh, as a refugee, when we feel that we are finally settled somewhere safe, I think when I say we, I mean Iranian writers, journalists, or poets, or musicians, or movie makers, that they had no choice but flee the country. Uh, <clears throat> I think if the first thing that we think is, okay, there are many a story here, I want to tell that, you know, I want to say, and Australia is safe and they gave me freedom and I have freedom of expression, so why not writing? I think it's amazing, it's huge. I always in Iran was, you know, I was um, uh, part of Iranian journalists that we call it uh, reformist journalists. Uh, about, we started working about 20 years ago. And uh, we all tried, um, it, we've been in like a generation that we try to change regime by writing, by, you know, um, discussing, by peaceful ways, you know, which never, you know, make anything change. But uh, when, we, when we came here, we s still we think of Iran. I think a still of Iran after 10 years living in Australia, and I think there are many, many stories, important stories that we should be, they should be said to the world. And Australia gave me this freedom. And uh, I think it's the most important things that we, and Australia has, and I always, always value this. And even in the uh, front page of my book, say that I am thankful to Australian people and Australian country that they gave me this safety to um, not fear of writing. If I wrote this book in Iran, I was not, definitely I wasn't alive. It, there is no depth, not, not about me, any writers who write. We have, we have some example in Iran that the writers been arrested just because they wrote and kept in the co their own computer at home. They didn't even publish it. But then they sentenced for five years because you wrote this story. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. And so I think it's very important. You know, I always, maybe it is my character, I always try to see more positive things. This is why your previous uh, question, I didn't say any negative things because not there is not a negative things. There is always negativity everywhere in this world about race, about gender, about, I don't know, your background, about your, you know, your hair color, about your fats, about, you know, <laughs> whatever. But uh, how we can deal with that, to me, is just to look what you want and focus on this on the positive way and go on. And uh, otherwise, if you want too much, cons you know, focusing on negative way, we just, I, in my opinion, we republish negative way, negative things, you know. Um, Zoroastrian, Zoroast, what do you say in English? Zartosht, we say. Zartosht is an ancient uh, philosopher, an um, Iranian ancient philosopher and prophet. He said that for fighting with, with, uh, with darkness, you don't need sword, you need candle. So this is the way that I choose to live. So I think it's the be best way to fight with the ignorance. That's I love that because um, when I first started off writing and I was at a, um, an event like this and there was a writer on the stage who was a journalist and he said how his editor had said to him that his job was to shine a light in all the dark places mm, yeah. and that just it resonated so much with me. That was, you know, I went, oh, okay, this is, this is the way I want to go and it's, yeah. it's the same thing. Um, and it is, it's that idea of, you know, presenting, presenting people with the way the world is but then as a way as a way to fight it, you know, as a, as a way, because, you know, using knowledge and words as a way to fight back at um, what you see is wrong and, yeah. Can I ask you to talk um, to how you took the narrative in the medium um, and wrote The Bone Sparrow? So, I believe it was uh, drawings published in the media in a newspaper of, of children, uh, sorry, drawings done by children living in detention um, that gave you an insight into what it must be like to not have a home and not have safety and be uh, in Australia but not in Australia and how you wrote for a, a younger audience. Yeah, so I'd been, I'd been doing a whole lot of research at that stage. Um, there, 
I think because I, I started, I got the idea of writing a, a book about a child growing up in a detention centre um, many years before I, I actually ended up writing it. And I, I stopped because we were told that, you know, there were, there were no more children in detention. And I went, oh, okay, this you know, book no longer needs to be written. I did something else. And then, of course, we realised that that wasn't true. Um, so I went back to the idea. And when I first started researching it, I'd found a whole lot of these redacted incident reports that were coming out of the detention centres. Um, and even though they were really heavily redacted, it was quite it was quite amazing seeing you know the the information that was there um, and the overall feeling that was that was coming from these statements um, and you could really get a really strong sense of what life was like um, from these these statements and so I had that research I had some aerial footage I had some photographs um, but there was not a lot of information coming out about what what it was actually like in the detention centres especially because they were offshore we weren't you know there wasn't much access it was out of sight out of mind and um, very gated. Uh, and then I, I did, I stumbled upon um, these drawings that children had, had drawn in refugee camps and detention centres. And they were, they were extraordinary in the sense that they immediately took me into the child, child's mind. Um, and in both really, in both hopeful ways, but also really horrific ways as well. So um, the, the picture I always remember was of a, um, that the part of it I remember was that the son, so you, this, this child had drawn a picture of themselves um, behind a wire fence, um, and I think she was saying, you know, please help me or something horrible. Um, but the thing that really got me was that the sun in the sky was really angry. And, you know, I had young kids, and I was looking at it saying, you know, my kids draw a sun, and it's either just a sun or it's got a stupid smiley face on it. But someone, you know, these, this, this child the same age has drawn a picture of, a, of an angry sun, and, and how would you be feeling to, to draw an angry sun? It was something that was so... I just couldn't comprehend how you must be feeling to draw in that way. Um, and so I looked at more and more of these pictures, and that, that got me inside the headspace. But then I also found things like photos of... Um, two little girls who were playing in the rain and one was jumping in a puddle and there was such joy on their faces and it was it was that moment that I went okay so th however I write this that has to be the focus is how you can find joy um, in what must be you know one of the most horrible places on earth. Oh, sorry before you start I want to say something um, um, government lets you go to inside of the camps? No. Hmm. Because I, when I was camp in Christmas Island, I want to start writing, you know, as a you know journalist. I want to interview people and ask them what they're feeling, because it was new for me too, and I had no any idea when I come to Australia. They keep kept me in the keep me in the camp. So I thought, so like Europe, I think, you know, you go to society, but the process of immigrating also is, you know, going on. But anyway, it was very new for me. And I saw lots of people that they been there for more than three, four, five months. When I came to Australia, it was 2010. Uh, October 2010 and it wasn't like later that like Behruz Buchani been in the camp for six years so but it still was very you know it was very unique situation to see what really people think and, and then I asked some uh, Im, uh, immigration officers to am I allowed can you give me some you know recorder or something they said laughed to me and said what do you think and then later we see that in the you know what happened to Papua New Guinea so they even don't you know Australian government democratic country they even don't let journalists go to the island yeah not even the UN it's like it was yeah. it's yeah. huge yeah. things you know we talk we are we are in heart of democracy I think yeah I mean it's not hearts but we are neighboring <laughs> we are close to but you know so my question <coughs> for both of you is, we know not everything is reported, um, or if it's published, it's redacted. We know that journalists and, um, and, and writers can't go in. So when we look at the public narrative that we get in politics, but also in all other writing that is published, in you, both of your opinions, what is missing so far? What, what hole, if any, can literature fill to help change people's minds or change the debate? I think we need journalists inside of the camp. Oh, absolutely. This is what but really if we, we need that. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I know, but we should find, I mean, I'm not, I'm not journalist anymore, unfortunately. I really miss this job, but I think journalists should do that. Somehow, I don't know, they 
do tricks, they should use somehow. I, I believe on that, really. Because if governments say this door is closed, the job of journalists is exactly broke the door and go inside and see what's going on. This is my understanding about journalism. And this is why I'm not in Iran <laughs> and I'm in <laughs> Australia now. But uh, this is the things that missed, you know, we should have first-hand stories from inside of the camp. What security officers doing with the refugees? What different culture of people inside of the camp doing to each other? I was evidence, I was only one month in Christmas Island, but I was evidence of two huge fights between, I mean, um, what you say, fight between uh, different cultures. I, I, as I remember, was between uh, Indonesian people. Some we had refugees from different cultures. Uh, sorry, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, and uh, and Iraqi people. Something a small things happened between two of them, and then both nationalities actually came together, and you know, fight. He, the fight was the, took all of the day. And uh, people, you know, damage things, and you know, so we need to know all of these kind of things, and people should know, you know. I and I believe that is not also good things to look at immigrant or asylum seekers like, you know, they are the best. We should all the time open the door, you know. We should see more reality things. Not, I don't like a government's point of view. Also, I don't think that we should be so, like, naive that, and, you know, everybody should come in. Of course, many, many of we are talking about majority. Majority of people are innocent. They are hurted from the war, from many things. But there are also criminals there. I, I saw them. I saw some of them. But how government want to re recognize them? It's complicated. It's not easy to find out, especially when people don't have um, ID, ID cards or any, you know, background information. But what makes us to have a more realistic view about immigrants is to just read more direct information about them. This is what I think. Do you read both of your books? <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, I think for me, you know, what was... When I was, um, before I started writing Bone Sparrow, I was, what I was seeing was statistics and government policies and what was really missing at that time, this was sort of 2013, were the, the human stories. And so it was very easy for people to, to not think about what was happening. It was very easy for these um, people just to become numbers on a page. Um, and so it, that was sort of my inspira you know, inspiration for writing was to bring back a human face to the to the issues um and yeah absolutely you know if we could if we could get journalists to to have the, the freedom to report on what's happening then absolutely that's the way forward um but when we can't do that then then story and narrative um there's a i love there's an ira glass quote which i'm gonna mess up now but something along the lines of that narrative is the back door into into people's minds um and that sense that if people can't look at facts for whatever reason because it's too hard because they feel too guilty because they can't cope with it then you go in through narrative and you know, people get the information and they they understand it but on a on a very human level you go in and you talk to kids in schools um, you know teachers schools invite you in to have discussions about the bone sparrow uh, with young kids and i like to think that is changing the next generation but when you see uh stories in the media of um uh problems at the border or, or whatever the political spin of the day is. Do you find you get more invites to schools or it, it, does it, is there a response? Um, yes and no, the, probably no in the sense that, you know, for a school they have to plan fairly, you know, far in advance. Um, I've certainly been getting more invites to schools in recent years mm -hmm. um, and especially interestingly quite um, what you'd think of as conservative schools. Um, and so that's that's a really interesting change that I'm I'm seeing. Um, but what is in interesting, you know, in relation to that is that when so when I wrote the Bone Sparrow, I sent it to my publisher at the time, and they said, ah, no one wants to read it. Like no one wants to read this stuff. It's too hard. Put it in a drawer. And I went, okay. And I thought I'm going to keep, you know, I'm going to keep fighting. See if I can see if I can find a home. And I sent it to all the publishers that were open for submissions in Australia. I sent it to a whole bunch of agents. No one wanted to see it. Um, or no one was interested in, in, in publishing it, and then I sent it to an agent in the UK who picked it up immediately and, and, sh and she ran with it. And then when she was 
um, when she was flogging it um, around the publishers at that it was that week that um, there was a, a refugee boat that sank um, and there were children's bodies on the shore and that absolutely without a doubt was the reason I got so much interest. I have no um, questions about that. So it means even if journalists can somehow uh, make a, um, you know, interview directly, give information. So what media want to publish this? This is a question. Yeah, Television? Exactly. What yeah. channel? I don't see that. Which newspaper? Yes. Which newspaper? Mm. Independent media. We should all be supporting <laughs> independent media. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to move us on a little bit to kind of what happens next. Now, I know it hasn't been published yet, Shukufa, but uh, for RMIT, you have written a short piece called The Seventh Way, and that is your reflections on, um, I in the piece you call Australia a second home and how uh, Australia has become a second home for you. And that is not necessarily something that we often get to um, read about in short form uh, media reports, but also in long form works in literature. And I wanted to invite you to talk about um, your most recent piece that will soon be published. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, yes, RMIT asked me to write something about my 10th anniversary of living in Australia. And uh, so I think what I wrote was about, you know, we have six, seven ways to deal our relationship with Iranian regime. So we should be killed, we should be jailed, we should be, um, what you say in English, home prison, you know, they take you inside of home, you are not allowed to go outside. And also another thing that they, can, they do is they ban you from writing. So you are, you, you are free, but you are not allowed to work. And um, I mentioned all of these ways that the uh, Iranian government deal with us. And the last way to us is to just flee. And um, we have something in Iran. If there are Iranian here, they know that we call it Iranian chain murderer by Iranian regime. So uh, we, have a, we had eight years war between Iran and Iraq. And immediately when war finished, um, Khomeini, the leader of um, um, regime, uh, ordered to kill all of opponents inside of the jails. If some people say it was 5,000 people, some people even say it's 15,000 people, which is the actually uh, the main story of my previous novel, The Enlightenment of the Green Gage Tree. And uh, so, and uh, but in the chain murder, after this, after what's happened in the jail, um, they start new way of killing intellectuals. They made a list, they call it blacklist, and it was included of something between 150 or 200 Iranian intellectuals, all high educated journalists, writers, poets, um, even uh, actress and actors, and they killed them in the brutally way that you can imagine and in the mystery ways. They didn't execute them officially. They, you know, like they kidnapped them and then killed them in the desert around of Tehran. And uh, when it's happened frequently, Iranian journalists start to, you know, to to try to find out what's going on and then they found all of them are very famous intellectuals and they, they call this series of murders uh, chain murderers by Iranian regime and uh, so my second novel is about that and um, so if we as a journalist if we as a someone who doesn't want to give up fight for freedom and freedom of speech we ha we deal this kind of things so the last way is flee the country but when you flee the country, you don't flee just for saving your, saving your life. You, you flee because you think there is something here that should be said somewhere safe, you know. And um, this is the only thing that gives you hope for continuing your life because you feel guilty because all of your colleagues, are still, some of your colleagues are still in, the, in Iran, your family are in Iran, you know, your love, your country, your, I don't know, everything that I love in Iran. You left behind. It's sad. It's really sad, you know. And uh, but uh, still, you say, okay, there are lots of positive things. This is part of our history. And I always think he Iran has a huge, beautiful history from thousands of years. And 
this civilization is amazing and I am just a small piece of it and this is my destiny to live in another country but I'm still thinking for Iranian culture and Iranian future and thanks to you Australia actually you give me this chance to be safe and right and uh, so my note was about that yeah and you write so beautifully we are going to have questions from the audience. So if you have questions, mic roving mics will come around um, shortly. Um, while you're thinking, Shakufa, I would like to ask, you had to flee Iran because you couldn't write and publish there. You have lived in Australia now for a decade and you did publish The Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree, uh, shortlisted for the Stella Prize and also uh, you were the first Iranian author to be um, listed for the International Booker. Now that's um, published in English and Farsi. And my question for you is, given Iran's present day and recent history, what do you think the legacy of The Enlightenment of the Green Gauge Tree is? As an Iranian author who has written whilst living in Australia, but in Farsi, which has been circulated underground in Iran and then around the world. What is that legacy? Um, maybe the myth. So it is multi multi-layer novel. It's, it's, there are many things going on. I, I want to say many things in there. But in regards to Iran, I want to say that, hey, Iranian people, we're living in a very dark time but there are amazing lightness around of us if we just learn how to look at it. And this is culture. Iran always been in attack from 1,000 years ago by uh, Greek, Rome, and then Arabs, and, and also Mongolian Mughals. We have huge you know, uh, history of another countries that attack Iran, but none of them had influence, a strong influence as Islam had. 1400 years ago, Arabs attacked us, but still now in modern life, we are struggling with this religion and our, reli our political system represent this religion. And what I wanna say that to Iranian people actually that we always, you know, Iran always raised again after any attack and this time can do this again, just if we, uh, hold our culture. Iranian culture is so beautiful. And if you don't know, go and search about Iranian civilization. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. That is definitely the, the um, overriding feeling I get having, you know, when I finish your book as well. It's that there's, there is a lot of really tough stuff that happens in it, but it's a it's an I can I say enlightening book. That's yeah, it's it's a wonderful up. It's you know it's uplifting. It's it's really it is so full of hope and strength. It's um yeah, yeah thank it's beautiful. You. I love it. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? We have one down the front here. Hello, hi. Um, I I had a question about writing in a second language, I suppose English. Um, and I haven't read these books. I was invited by a friend, so definitely going to. But um, I, I'm not sure if they were written I originally in Farsi or English, but I'm, I'm making a, a gross assumption that you're now writing in English um, some things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm very fascinated by, I've read some other authors, maybe, you know, Turkish or Chinese who write, have, have started writing in English and actually found that um, writing in English was preferred or gave them a different experience or, you know, was um, just different. And I'd really like to know how that is, is, is for you, yeah. Uh, it's a good question because uh, I, l I understand that Australian like read more English from English writers, which is good. But also it shows that they know less about other parts of the world. So in Iran, we really... I love that you just said yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sorry <laughs> to say that. <laughs> in Iran, we really appreciate translators. Always name of translators is on the book, on top on the cover, under the name of the writers, to show how much we are accepting, how much we are accepting other literatures. This is part of the culture that I say I love in Iran. And uh, so in Australia, it was really difficult. So I sent my book when it's finished to many, I was, you know, uh, perhaps I was working on the cloud. <laughs> I thought I sent to Penguin and all big publisher and they say, hey, Shukufe, you are a good writer. <laughs> but none of them care at all. So 
<laughs> they sent, they didn't say, even they didn't respond my email or mail, and some of them sent back the package of my stories printed, even didn't open it, they just sent it back, <laughs> until I found Wild Dingo Press in uh, Melbourne. And uh, thanks God, they like it and they publish it, and it, it's difficult, but in, the, in case of translating, M Farsi is a very, you know, is not a common language. Chinese is much more common language now, and Farsi is not. And the translator should know English as good as Farsi. So it's, it still is very difficult to find translator, but I was lucky to find one, and they worked with me, and uh, so the whole process done. And But, you know, it took me two years and a half to finish my novel, and also it took me like three years. To find, tra to finish translator and find publisher and get published, so it's five years process. So, are you writing your PhD in English or Farsi? Oh, good question. So, it's a, <laughs> uh, it's I'm doing uh, in creative writing, and uh, the main section of work is my novel, and I'm doing in Farsi. And they accept that. I, I am so lucky. That's wonderful. <laughs> because I cannot creative work in English. I can do academic writing or, you know, nonfiction in English, but creative writing is so complicated for me. So, yes, I was lucky that Deakin University accepted. <laughs> Um, thank you for sharing that. I, it makes me think of um, Anita Heiss's latest book um, is the first commercial work of fiction published in Australia with um, a First Nations language on the front cover. Uh, forgive my <coughs> um, mispronunciation, but um, uh, Billy Yaradangalangdre, um, uh, published by Simon Schust and Schuster, um, is the first major publisher in Australia to use First Nations language on the front of a commercial work of fiction. So to go to your point about, you know, Farsi in Australia, Australia has a very poor understanding of other languages and I'm so glad you are writing yeah. your PhD in Farsi. <laughs> Thank you very much and I also add that I, I try to give some grants for translating from my second novel to English. There is no mm. grant for people who live in Australia because I am citizen so they ex expect that I know English immediately as soon as I fit my, my, you know, my food in Australia. So it's never happened. So I need grants for translating my novel, but there is nothing like that. So this is all coming from how they look at other cultures. And we are, we, Australia is multicultural, but it will happen. That's true. Later. It's a little bit more work to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> do we have other questions? No? That's okay. Back to you, Astrid. Yeah, well, I have more <laughs> questions. Um, I am interested in the works that you are um, both working on, but not just the... Th I guess my question is, um, you are both published authors, you are both awarded authors. Do you find when you are putting together your next creative work, there are any areas that you don't feel will be well received? in Australia, any topics that you feel a publisher might not want or mm -hmm. um, a, a certain nuance that you might have to put on to um, to get published? So, for example, before you said, you know, no one wanted your novel until, it, you know, um, a, a terrible story was all over the news and then suddenly it looked more appealing. So when you are working, do you feel like you self-edit? Um, I don't feel like I self-edit. I, I, I do come across that because I write for kids and young adults. Um, I do come across sometimes a bit of resistance as to what is acceptable for, for younger people. Um, but I actually don't think about that until I've already written it. And then, you know, I just, I just hope it'll find its home somewhere. Um, I think if I started to self-edit in that way, you know, these are the things I care about. And, and when I'm writing... Um, a lot, of, a lot of my books, as as um, my partner sometimes says, are very issues. He's, you know, he says, "Are you going to do another do good at issues book?" <laughs> In a very nice, kind way. But um, and it's 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 that sense that you know I'm not setting out to write a do good at issues book. But these are the things that I care very strongly about. Um, and it's I think it goes back to that sense of writing um, as 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 a form of resistance. Um, and so, you know, when I was writing all of my m most recent books, these were all because of research I'd found about the way that we in this country and, and in other countries as well are treating people and especially young people. Um, and, it, you know, that words have power. 
Um, and so for me, it was it was the only way I could, you know, really fight against what what I could see was happening in my country, um, and hope to hope to somehow make it a bit better. Words do have power. We are here tonight to reflect on migration and detention and how the power of literature and words can help us uh, address the crises that we face, those problems that we face as a society. Both of you are not only writers, but you are also readers. And I was wondering if each of you could uh, share or recommend a book with us that does tackle something that we need to be thinking about. Uh, first, I want to answer your previous question, if I have, if we have time. Oh, we do. Please uh, go. Yes. Um, actually, it's happened to me two weeks ago. I am also a screenwriter and playwriter, and I love to do this in Australia, too. And then I called one of my friends who was in a council of arts and uh, culture of uh, Australia, and uh, I asked him that I want to do about this topic, and he said, what's the topic? I said, I want to do a magic realism a screenwriting on based on true stories of uh, asylum seekers in um, Christmas Island. And he said, Shukufe, no. Ah. And I said, why? He said, because when all of, he said that all of the movies in Australia uh, found founded by government first. And government choose, they don't, they don't say that, they don't you know, announce it, but it is what really happened. They choose which topic you're doing that. First of all, if it is asylum seeker, no. If it is love story, maybe yes, it, <laughs> you know. And it's true, it's happened. Just two weeks ago, I talked with him, and he said, Shukufa, no, you can write as a novel maybe, uh, but as a movie, cinema, because it's huge money coming by government, government just can't say no, and they say no. Just do it anyway. <laughs> I want to Yeah, I love my realism yeah. in cinema. <laughs> yes. W will you do it, or ha have you made a decision yet? Um, yes, I am doing. Yes, Good. I'm doing. Yeah. Yes, yes, Good. I'm doing. My third novel is also about asylum seekers in, Cas in uh, Christmas Island. Yeah, magic realism again. Do you have a date for that second novel? When w when it will be? Oh published? no, never. <laughs> 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 no, but I try. I really try to finish it uh, in end of this year. Yeah, it should be finished should be finished yeah very much looking forward yes, to that thank you very much i just wanted to check there were no more questions oh we do now have one down the front here <laughs> my question is about what you think is the barrier to getting these stories told i find it interesting that you had to go overseas to get an agent to represent this body of work and i know that you would not be the first female author writing about issues related to race um uh, and, and authors of, of colour as well who have not been able to get an agent in Australia, have not been able to get a publisher in Australia and have to, had to go around about to do that. Do you think the problem is with Australian society or do you think the problem is with Australian publishing and do you think publishing does enough to change what society thinks on these issues? Um. Oh, that's such a loaded question. <laughs> it's like <laughs> egg and chicken. Um, there, there are so many things I want to say. I mean, I think, I think there's real power in small press. So um, I've certainly found that, um, and you know, I'm with I'm with big publishers as well as some smaller publishers. But um, I find that quite often, bigger publishers are looking for, uh, th they're, they're commercial, so they're, they're looking for what will sell. And, you know, th and it is a problem with Australian society is that, you know, the, these books don't sell. So, um, you know, it's certainly not compared to, to other books, um, and especially perhaps in, in children's and YA market. Um, so I think it, it's, a, it's a problem with the publishing industry as a whole, um, and as we've seen with the lack of diversity in publishing all around the world, um, it's not it's not an issue with who's writing because there are there are lots of authors writing, um, but it's a problem with who's deciding that these books are valued and that these authors' sh voices should be heard, um, and it goes right to the top. So we need to have we need to have great diversity at the at the top of the publishing houses in order for for the writers to to get space. Absolutely, but I would also say that it's the whole ecosystem as well. It's diversity in booksellers, so the right books are, you know, put face out in a bookstore. Librarians. Um, librarians, 
Um, uh, it's, it's universities, diversity mm. of staff on university faculties and letting students in um, a diverse cohort. It's so multifaceted, I think. Um, yeah, and a willingness to get anybody published, I think, um, is sometimes lacking. Do you have a, a further comment, Shakufa? Uh, about the in this question or um, about the question from the oh, I had question. Yep. Yeah, so I think it's as I just shortly I said is like egg and chicken. So it's very difficult to point that publisher make the society's choice or taste or people, you know, make publishers to choose what they want to do. But I, I believe if I was publisher, I publish whatever I want. I write whatever I want. So I'm like kind of... We should of start <laughs> a publishing house. Yeah, together. Yeah. <laughs> we do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I ask you to leave us with your final thoughts? Oh, you just I'll go first just because I wanted to answer the question you s asked before about... Um, book recommendation oh yes, um, yes which I realized we sort of we, we left behind um, so for me there are two books that weren't around when I was researching but now are uh, one's called forced to flee um, and I'm, I can't remember who the who it was edited by uh, and the other one is called home and that's edited by Ben Doherty uh, who's a journalist with The Guardian and both of those are books that have published children's pictures um, from refugee camps and detention centers and they're fantastic. You know, if you want to get an insight into to what life is like in these places, then, then that's that's where to go. Um, and the other one uh, we were talking about earlier is Persepolis, which is a, a graphic novel. Um, and it's it's amazing and it, it's wonderful by Maria Strapje, I think. And that was also shortlisted for the... Um, I've forgotten what prize that was shortlisted for. I'm so sorry. I, I didn't know yeah, it was. Yeah, so national no, it was awards? a graphic novel. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but it's a good book. Yeah, yeah it's I loved about it. Iran after Islamic Republic. Yeah. So f I cannot really mention a book because in last few years I just reading lots of non-fiction books in mythology, and also about um, the f uh, the relationship between psychology and mythology and history. So this is my favorite topics, and also about um, ancient things and how we can bring mythology in our modern life. So this is what things, the kind of things that I'm re reading now. So I can just tell you, Mircea Eliade is my favorite mythologist. He was Romanian, and if you like mythology, you can read him. And uh, still I'm reading uh, Carl Gustav Jung's, and uh, still I'm reading Joseph Campbell's. So all of these mythologies are my favorite things, but not connected to immigration or, you know, asylum seeker. <laughs> but still beautiful recommendations. Can we please have a round of applause for Zana and Shukufa? Yeah, thank you. Thank you.